Up on the fan tail, ladies and gentlemen, our host of the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Al Cuppet. Al? Yeah, he thinks I'm on the fan tail. He can't see me, but he knows I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're there, and we're on a bright, shiny new studio, uh, right. so we're we're all set to go. All right, good. Now, one of the first thing out tonight, I want to tell Matt. Matt, I got your letter. Uh Pat, if you're listening, and he's not listening, tell him I got the letter, and uh, when I get unbusy, I will give him a ring and or a letter or whatever. It's uh, uh, been a hectic week here, and uh, I've learned how to do my exercises again, so it makes me feel a lot better. So we're here again, folks. We were off last week for a transfer of a venue for our producer, and you all need to... Uh, His phone tells me I got an incoming, an incoming voicemail. And I said, That's, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to have to do it anyhow without turning the phone off. The emails are kind of messed up, folks. Uh, I got to figure out how to change the appearance of this stuff coming in. I don't know. My wife says, uh, you must have done that. I said, I didn't do anything. I just typed letters on it. It comes in. The emails come in different. It's not my fault. So anyhow... I'm doing the best I can, and uh, we've got some things tonight to talk about. But first, let's have a word of prayer before we start, and ask the Lord to bless the program. It's paramount that we do that. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We ask you to bless us this night. We ask you, Lord, that your angels might encamp round about the listeners and around myself, about our families, Lord, and around our producer. Be with us, O Lord, and we give you praise and honor and thanks for the wonderful things you've done and what you're going to do in the future, although it does look bleak. We pray for the program and the listeners tonight. Bless them, Lord. We pray for Margie out there with arthritis. We pray for Sean and his problem with his his blood. Lord, we pray for Marion, Marjorie, over at the Western Approaches. We pray for Lou and Isaac and Anissa, O Lord, at this point in their family. Watch over them down south, Lord. Be with them, O Lord. Guide them and direct them, and, Lord, may we all be wise as serpents and harms as doves in these critical times. We pray for Israel right now and for Prime Minister Netanyahu. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Inverdown in South Africa, Lord, and his mom, and we pray, Lord, for those that were on the tour, for Julie and Denny from India, Lord. We ask you to bless them and uh, bless those I don't remember. I think one of the sisters, Sharon, I forget who she is, but she wrote a nice email, Lord, and asked you to bless her. Bless them all, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask you now, give us faith, and we bind all fear in the name of Jesus. Replace it, Lord, with faith as we go through this program tonight. In the name of Jesus, we ask amen and amen. i got a scripture I'm going to read to you. I've read it before, but it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and it says, Know this also, Paul telling Timothy, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. This is homosexuals, okay? Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, in this case means they cannot control their actions, cannot control their mouth, whatever. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, oh man. Have you ever seen a bunch of traitors like we've got now? Petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the powers thereof. And then it says uh, in the seventh verse, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And uh, this is what's happening. They ever learn, smartest guys in the world, but they cannot come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's how we face it right now in our society and in our world. A couple of things I want to talk about. Brother Bob warned us when Billy Graham passes away, there's going to be Absolute catastrophe is going to break upon this country. The news tonight that he is going to preach his last sermon. From the sermon, I, from the prayer, hurting prayer, pray he has to be saved. Um, he 
said some pretty scurrilous things about more than one way to heaven a while back talking to Robert Schuler. I heard it on tape myself. But uh, he's up in years. His wife's going on. His son-in-law got into a lot of trouble down here in Charlottesville. Probably talked to the wrong Bible. You use the wrong Bible. You don't use an authorized version. You're going to get yourself in trouble. I'm going to warn you right now. We've seen some terrible storms um, <clears throat> coming, and there's one down a hit by a Philippines. It's a typhoon, a super typhoon. It is past Category 5. Now, Brother Bob told us there's going to be a, a hurricane hit the East Coast. It's going to be and in Florida later on, at probably two different events. With 240 mile an hour winds, well, this one in time in uh, off the coast of Philippines right now, it's got 195 mile an hour winds gushing to 230. Folks, you don't understand. No, none of us understand what that's like. None of us understand what that is like. I flew in an airplane at 120 and put my thing hand out the window. I hate to think what it is with 100. 95 miles an hour winds. The buildings, houses in the Philippines. I've been there, up in the hills. They are not. I've been in the hills, but I've been in the Philippines. But I've read about the Philippines. I've seen many, many pictures of during World War II. They live in pretty flimsy stuff. But nothing's going to withstand 195 mile an hour wind. Even 60. Is, is is just absolutely uh, scary, okay? So, Lord, we ask you to watch over the Christian saints in the Philippines, Lord. I don't know what you can do, Lord, but you can do whatever you want to do, but I ask you, Lord, to help them. Dear Jesus. Como esta acá? Como esta acá? Mabuti, mabuti. Anyhow, that's what they say in the Philippines. I want to talk about, uh, well, let me look at this other thing right here. I've got a letter from, i got an uh, email from Ruby. And you know, uh, we talked about power outages and uh, there were, it's a projected and scheduled exercise FEMA. They're going to have a power grill drill, power grid drill, 13th and the 14th of November. This is what the word of the blurb is. I'm not sure. You know, you never know the truth, but you can usually figure it out. I'm able to figure it out after it happens. We've got several warnings about the third, 13th and 14th, 17th of November. <clears throat> And uh, four different people saw these visions about this, and it's not looking good. I got this, Al, please forward this in conjunction with your own warnings for America around 12 November. 12 November is seven weeks after Sukkot, which is what our dear sister got, whether it be in Israel or America. One of the two is going to happen for sure. Now, don't say Al Cuppet said it. Al Cuppet said what people told me. They saw in visions from heaven, okay? The Lord has not given me any supernatural visions or supernatural prophetic input to me, myself, okay? The real American blackout. Will the electric industry really examine the grid's vulnerability? This is from a National Geographic, National Geographic film. New video suggests the cost of failure to do so the electric, so that is for the electric industry to examine their grids and vulnerability. On Sunday night, National Geographic aired an alarming and most timely docudrama entitled American Blackout. It explores a trauma that will be experienced by the United States and its people should there be a prolonged nationwide blackout caused by a major disruption to the nation's power grid. This is coming from... Uh, Shirley and Bannister Public Affairs. They're out of Northern Virginia, evidently. I might give them a call. That's the number on here. 
In mid-November, the real test of the grid will take place when 100 electric companies, at least in the first it was 150, then it's 100, now it's 100. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, participated in a nationwide exercise dubbed GridX. It's supposed to demonstrate how well the grid can cope with significant disruptions. A new video, and I sent this out to everybody. You can click on here and see the video. On the blue line here, produced by the EMP, Electromagnetic Pulse Coalition, however, raises questions about whether GridX will actually test the nation's bulk power distribution system and be conducted in a manner calculated to obscure the grid's actual vulnerabilities. The electrical utilities in their trade association, regulatory organization, NERC, have to date proven resistant to examining, rigorous, examining rigorously, let alone remediating, the grid's vulnerabilities to various threats, including physical attacks, cyber warfare, electromagnetic pulse. And they're referring here to HEMP, H-E-M-P, High Altitude Electromagnetic Pulse. The geographic film describes how a cyber attack would leave the nation without critical infrastructures that provide everything necessary to life in 21st century America including food, water, fuel, transportation, medicine, communications, and finance. Folks, the Lord spoke to me in 1992 and said, no, prepared an ark saving of his house. No, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He told me three times at 3 o'clock in the morning, three days in a row. And I said, well, I don't have anything to prepare. I don't have any money. My mom handed me a list and said, here, uh, here's what, how much I got. I think you ought to buy some stuff. And I said, yeah, I got the list here, Mom. Uh, it was a five-figure wad of uh, dollars, okay, the next day. The horrific consequences of such provision, I'm sorry, of such priv- what's that word? privation, I guess, privation for a 10-day period explored in the film let alone a much more protracted period, are such that if the grid is vulnerable in the way shown in the American Blackout film, everything must be, that is possible must be done to eliminate such weaknesses. Now, this is subsequent to the warnings that I had received from five people, okay? This came out. And then we had Glenn Beck talking about it on his show. The EMP coalition, that's an ad hoc group made up of many nation, of the nation's leading experts and organizations committed to preventing the grid and critical infrastructures from the terrible consequences of long-duration loss of power, encouraged every American to view the video, The Real American Blackout, and join in insisting that Grid X2 will be an, will be an honest examination of the state of the, the nation's electric infrastructure, and a catalyst to the corrective actions needed to protect it against all threats, man-caused and naturally occurring. Uh, You can go to uh, www.stopemp.org. Stop EMP, S-T-O-P-E-M-P, capital E-M-P, dot org. Blessings from Samaria, Ruby. Now, I didn't get to see Ruby when I was in Israel, but I did get to talk to him. He's about an hour north of Jerusalem. So he sent me this and asked me to tell you about it. I've got another thing here which uh, came in from Steve Quayle. If some of you haven't read it, I will read it to you. Forward is the subject, training with DC-130 at Spectre gunships on churches. Read this and weep. Dave, you can take this to the bank. From Chris, Brother Steve, peace be with you. I pray that what I tell you will be a benefit in keeping many of the frozen chosen safe. I guess he's talking about frozen, cold Christians, okay? I often listen to you on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Your insight has 
given me quite a thorough understanding of what we face as active duty members and as Americans. Sir, I have experienced a few things in my short career as an AC-103U aerial gunner in the Air Force Special Operations Command, as you can imagine. What I have to share with you deals with the training we do on a normally nightly routine, on a normal nightly routine. During our normal four or five hour training missions here in the States, we accomplish a live fire mission over one of the Eglin Air Force Base ranges, that's in Florida. And then we continue a dry fire mission over a town in Alabama and Florida. A dry a live fire mission is simulated live fi- is a simulated a dry fire mission is a simulated live fire mission without expending any Rounds from the plane. I believe you might know the capabilities of the AC 130U spooky gunship, so I won't cover them. But I can tell you, folks, I've seen them, they told us about them, and I've seen them firing in Vietnam. And when you can see them from a distance, you see a, uh, a column of red fire come down from the ground. You see it go down, and you hear Wah! like that. You see a burst of fire a stream of fire coming out of the sky. You can't see the plane, but you can see the fire coming down. And then you can hear the, uh, it's about a few miles away, and it gets away a little bit, and then you hear the roar. You hear a roar. It sounds like a chainsaw almost. It's a, it's a grumble with all in bullets being fired, 6,000 pounds a minute. During a dry fire mission, the aerial gunners mainly practice calling, our, calling out combat evasion maneuvers to move the plane away from simulated threats. That's any aircraft fire. And uh, man pad, now, I'll tell you what, i got to tell you, I don't know what man pad is, okay? That's a new one on me. A very demanding requirement in crew communications in order to keep our, our, our to almost all of the members even, our crew members safe. The dry fire missions are brief after the crew, after the crew brief prior to takeoff. Early, I'm sorry, each dry fire mission has a, combat scenario that is followed in order to complete the required training for a given flight. Every scenario has GPS core coordinates of the simulated enemy headquarters positions. So far, 80% of the dry fire I have been on, simulated enemy headquarters positions would be a church, the primary target. Picture this, at 9,000 feet in a third degree bank orbiting, an AC-130 gunship with firepower enough to handle most any close air support call for fire tasking is above it. Is above any town USA. It's a, along with a simulated stack of UAV unmanned aerial vehicles at 67,000 feet, feet and a fast mover over top. I used to talk about a fa- uh, there's a plane up there on a fighter cap or something. I'll try to give you the seal for a mission ex- execution. Pattern is simulated, cleared, and we will have a clearance to go hot over the target unless we have a kill box, then it's open season. First simulated round of 105 millimeters. This one's when they got a cannon sticking out, okay? It's sent through the roof of the building. This stirs the enemy, and soon they're running in every direction. Time to go dual target attack mode. With 105 still addressing the building structure, we then simulate the number one 25 millimeter and number two 40 millimeter or 40 millimeter gun on the line to assist in eliminating any IR signatures that are simulated that is running out of the doors and buildings and windows. This means that they can see the people running, the little green people running, and they take them out with. Well, I think if they shoot 25 millimeters and 40 millimeters, that's huge. Those shells explode. Uh, they usually use, uh, they got a minigun that sprays stuff like a water hose. Everything during the event, during the dry fire mission is simulated. No live rounds ever get chambered or move towards the gun. What I want to make you aware of is our use of churches as enemy headquarters. 
Could it be the leadership? Or that leadership is desensitizing us, special ops crews, acquired professionals, in possible future missions and firing on churches? There might, there might be nothing to this training, but I thought you might want to see if your sources might know. God bless you and stay safe. Well, what can I say, folks? By the way, I've got a picture here. I was reading a magazine, and it was talking about Kennedy's assassination. And I'm looking at some frames from the Zapper to film, and they've only got a few frames here, but one frame they got, which I've seen on the JFK 2 video, JFK Roman numeral 2, it shows the driver of the car turn and shoot Kennedy with a 45 caliber, what appears to be a 45 caliber pistol, or it could be. It's a good sized pistol, okay? And one frame here, you can see the driver turning. You can see his arm with a pistol in it. You can see his head looking backwards. He is just about to pull the trigger because Kennedy's still leaning forward. And in the next frame, you'll see that gun jump, and you'll see Kennedy's in the next frame, Kennedy's head will go back. And shortly thereafter, Jackie climbed out of the car. That's because she heard the gun go off, she saw it, and she went out of that car. I got a picture right now, and this is the first time I've had a still picture of this, but I can see the guy's arm. I can see his shoulder. I can see him turning. He has turned, and he is shooting Kennedy in the head. Just like the video showed, if you watch it about seven times, you can see that. They covered the whole thing up. Kennedy signed a, an executive order issuing U.S. Treasury notes, not Federal Reserve notes, U.S. Treasury notes, silver certificates, and the bankers didn't want that to happen. They don't want any silver certificates out there because they want the silver for themselves. They don't want you to be tra- turning in silver, silver certificates to get silver. Well, that's impossible now, but it wasn't impossible back then. It was, pos- it was quite possible back then. He also fired Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. The CIA had bungled the Bay of Pig invasion and let, set up Castro, set Castro up. And... Uh, Actually, was he, he came to power right after fifty six, but in and when was it? It just when it was. It was in uh, sixty two, maybe, when the Bay of Pigs invasion was bungled. And we had some mercenaries go in there. We're going to go in and take over Castro, but we, but we didn't support them. They didn't give Kennedy the right information. They got they all got massacred and sent to jail. <clears throat> Now, folks, New World Order is huge, and they hate Christians, they hate Jews, and these people who are running it, the Illuminists, hate Jesus Christ, they hate the the children of Abraham by the flesh, that's the Jews, they hate Christians who are the spiritual sons of Abraham by the spirit, and they intend to eliminate us. We just had an election in Virginia, which was skewed, so the Democrat would win. I saw it coming from back in 92 and 96 when Perot ran and stripped off 7% in 92 and stripped off 3% of the vote in 96, and Clinton won twice. The guy, the president who said, I didn't have sex with that woman, okay, who was impeached but not convicted in the Senate. He's only the second president to ever been impeached. But like Johnson, who followed Lincoln, he did not. He was not convicted by the Senate. The Senate never even took a vote that I know of on Clinton. But that's because they didn't dare do that. Because they were, Clinton was bringing in the foreign troops and the foreign cops, they had to keep continuity. And uh, that was why the whole thing started to look hokey at the end. There, you can see how botched it was. You can, you can see this lack of. Uh, What's the word I can use? The lack of syntax or a lack of uh, 
the facts being lined up, you know. When that uh, Senate thing started, they got it through in the House. And then when the Senate thing started, you started seeing a lot of mishmash and a lot of just non-straight words and verbiage coming on the news about who was saying what in the Senate. Well, Perot won, went out and spent money, a millionaire, a billionaire from Texas, and two elections in a row and got Clinton elected twice. Third party. Same thing happened here in Virginia with Ollie North. He was running. They coerced uh, Marshall Coleman to run, and North lost. The Democrat won. Did the same thing uh, with Senator Kane here a while back. A guy named Russ Potts ran and uh, took votes away. So uh, George Allen lost. They, they know how to do it. They've got it down to a science. I'd like to tell you some of the things that happened in 2000 to keep control of the Senate. In Washington State, they had a Slade, what's his name, was was a Republican. They they picked a woman with millions and millions of dollars, and she ran won ran by a few points. Run she won by a few points with money. New Jersey, Corzine won with money. Joe by Joe Lieberman was running. In 2000, he ran as a, as a Democrat for vice president. But just before 2000, he decided he would switch over to, to be an independent. So in the 2000 election, he's running for vice president, but on the ticket in Connecticut, he was also on the ticket as a independent candidate for Senate. There was a Republican candidate for Senate and also a Democratic candidate for Senate. But Joe Lieberman, this has never happened before that I know of, where you run for two offices at the same time. And the Connecticut governor, I think was a Republican, let him do it. Let him stay on the ticket. So if he lost as vice president, he still got he still won as an independent senator and stayed in the Senate. They got their cake and eat it too. Well, they didn't get their cake, but they got to eat whatever because if he won... He would have gone as the vice president, and I don't know what they would have done in Connecticut if he if he'd also won there. He won there, what they'd have done. But that's how they did it. At the same time, uh, in Missouri, Mel Carnahan was running for the Senate as a Democrat. He, his plane crashed a week or so before, and he was probably not going to win was really close, so they crashed his plane and killed him. And then they then they said, oh, well, if, if if he wins the election, we'll give it to his wife. Wait a minute, he got a dead man running. There's a dead man on the ballot. How can you do that? They did it. And people sympathy voted for his wife. Oh, she don't have a job and she's going to be poor. And his wife got the job as a senator, and a dead man was on the ballot. This is how they do it. And there's been many, many, many politicians killed. Many politicians killed in airplane crisis. Dale Boggs would not sign off on the Warren Committee report. He wouldn't sign off. From Louisiana. Cookie Roberts. You know who Cookie Roberts is? You've heard of Cookie Roberts. Well, that's his daughter. Her name was Cookie Boggs. And she married somebody named Roberts. Larry McDonald was an up and rising Democratic star in the House of Representatives. He was a John Birch Society member. He knew what was going on. He got on a plane in Anchorage to go to Korea with Jesse Helms, but Jesse Helms decided not to show up. The plane took off and was supposedly shot down by a Soviet fighter. But the, uh, air, the, the the Northern Air Force Station in Japan saw the plane going down in a landing configuration. It didn't come down in a crash configuration. So those people were offloaded also. I was in the Pentagon when it happened, and there were some things I can't tell you that I know about. But we were complicit in it.
This is what they do. John uh, uh, Inoff, Senator Inoff from Oklahoma, he took off one morning with his plane and the propeller flew off. Now, he planned to go the night before in the dark, but he decided not to. And when the propeller flew off, he found the landing strip and put it down. Oh, the nighttime, he had crashed. And, and, and you can't see where to land at night because it's dark. No power. Unless you're right over top of the airport when the engine, when the power, when the power quits. Folks, the propeller cannot come off. The propeller has about 10 bolts on it. And there's, there's a nut on each bolt. And the nut has a hole drilled through it, right through the, through the bolt, through the bolt, chain to the bolt. And there's a thousand pound test stainless steel titanium wire that goes around through all the bolt holes, all the holes, and is all wound up tight so it can't possibly come off. Somebody took the wire off and undid all the bolts. If you didn't hear much about it, but I can tell you now, I just told you about it because I know about that kind of stuff. I've got a real close friend of mine who's an airframe and power plant mechanic who works on airplanes. John Heinz died in a plane crash from Pennsylvania, Senator Heinz. I don't know what the deal was on that one. Audie Murphy's going to run for House of Representatives in Texas and his plane crashed. Richard Obershane, and uh, we just had uh, Mark Obershane, his son, is running right now for lieutenant for uh, the attorney general position, which we call the Commonwealth Attorney. His father in 78 was nominated at a mass 12,000 people convention. His plane crashed that night and killed him. The next week they had an ad hoc convention and uh, John Warner and Elizabeth Taylor, the Elizabeth Taylor, who were citizens of Virginia, showed up and they put out, they didn't know what to do to the committee, so they said, okay, is there any nominations for the Senate seat? And Elizabeth Taylor nominated John Warner. Well, they said, well, we never heard that happen before. They had a little meeting at the executive committee and come back and said, okay, well, I guess we can do that. And they asked for seconds. Parliamentary procedure. And John Warner seconded his own nomination. And they said, well, we don't know if we can do that or not. And they had another little meeting. And they said, well, I guess we can. And somehow, Warner got the nomination and became a senator. He's a rhino. He was never conservative. He was never Republican-esque, Republican-esque, GOP-esque, you might say. He voted everything liberal. But I talked to the, who was then the chairman or the vice chairman of the Democrat, of the Republican Party in Virginia in 78. I'd met her a few times at a couple of political gatherings, and I saw her one day sitting in a restaurant, and I walked up to her. We started talking, and she said, you know, that's strange. The morning of the second convention, as I was getting ready to go to Richmond, Elizabeth Taylor and John Warner came to my house, knocked on my door. She lives in a big mansion. It's got a, it's got a name on it. It's got a special name and a highway marker. And they said, if you'll give me the nomination, we'll pay Mrs. Overshane's husband's fuel expenses. Very clever, huh? This is how they do it, folks. I got a uh, Paul Wellstone, a senator from Minnesota. I got a call from a friend of mine out there, and he says, I got, a, I got the address of the, his personal secretary. I want you to send her a letter with about six attachments. So I sent it to her, and Paul Wellstone voted against the war in Iraq. He was the only senator who voted against the war in Iraq in the fall of 2000 when they went so it was 2000, uh, 2002, I think it was the second war in Iraq, and uh, he voted against it. 
And uh, he got a lesson. He had a friend of his die, strangely, and he had to fly to the funeral to make his to make his to make his schedule. He didn't like to fly, but on a, if they came in on a final approach, there was a blue flash, the plane crashed and killed him. He cut the control cables. Like Woodrow Wilson found out, there's a bunch out there that are powerful. They're dangerous. You better not talk, speak against them above a whisper. This is the kind of stuff we're faced with. CWA 5, 4, 800 crashed. Egypt Air crashed. Swiss Air crashed. American 587 crashed. All four of them took off from JFK. Four planes crashed before they got to their destination. That's impossible. It could not have happened by chance. He looks a very dangerous airport to fly out of, if that's the case. Four wide-body air crashes from the same airport. But see, the people don't remember. We just had another refinery explosion. That makes five refineries, four chemical plants, two fertilizer plants, one sugar plant, four pipelines blew up, two oil platforms blew up. About 10 or 15 bridges have gone down. They keep blowing stuff up. And then nobody ever puts two and two together. What's happening? Well... Should you be afraid? No. If you listen to the Lord and you get out of that bed every morning and start to pray, and you pray for about a half an hour and open your King James Bible and you read it, and you look for the Lord to speak to you one way or another. You need to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you start reading and get in that Bible and start reading. I was as men should pray and not faint. It says, if we faint not, we'll reap. If we faint not. You don't faint and, and get scared at this. You just pray harder. And get in that Bible and stare at television. And pray. And do it when it's quiet so you can hear the Lord speak to you. I got a friend out in Arizona named David. He said, Oh, that works. I get up in the morning and pray, and the Lord can talk to me. Yeah. Well, I found. You see, the, Satan's only got so many fallen angels in, under his command. He's got a finite number. They can only be certain places at certain times, and I suspect when we're sleeping at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're over in India someplace, they're over in China causing trouble. For the, on their missions over there, and then when daylight comes, they whip back over here and start messing with us. So if you pray when they're not, I'm telling you right now, it is much, much easier to pray at 3 or 4 or 5 in the morning than it is at 7 or 8 or 9 or 10. It just really is. So much easier. My Jewish friends, the fellow who just sent me that email about sending out the power grid information, was the man who sponsored me in Israel at the Roots and Grass Association three years in a row. I spoke there in 05 for an hour. I spoke there in 06 for two, three hours, and I spoke there in 07 for, for six hours. I took all the slides and went through them all. I've done it now 126 places. 32 states, and six countries. And I stood up on a bus uh, in Israel a month ago and I give them about an hour's worth on the bus. I give them an hour's worth and then I give another half hour's worth. And I've gotten quite a few nice emails. They're starting to look at the stuff I told them. They were, uh, a few of them, 
you get two or three or four at the most out of 22, 25, whatever. You won't get very many. Uh, they just, most Christians, you just do not catch on. And uh, they use you your worst enemy when you try to tell them something. I don't believe that. That's okay. You don't have to believe me. It's my job to tell you. It's not my duty to make you believe. Spirits of God, it's his duty. It's his, it's his commission to tell you and convict, convict you that what I'm telling you is the truth. That's when I quote scripture like, you must be born again to go to heaven. You won't even hear it in your churches anymore. You ask the preacher, how do I be saved? Get saved. He said, we well, get saved from what? You don't know what you're talking about. And the old folks are coming back to the churches now. They're coming back. They're backslidden, and they want to come back to church and get saved. They, knew they, you know, they plan to come back later on. And they come back to the church now. There's no power in the church. There's no spiritual power to save anybody. I'm going to read Jerry Golden's uh, report. Read this one twice. In my last report, I mentioned the need to prepare to feed those whom we rescue and possibly others. There are two ways I'm aware of that would make it possible to feed large numbers. There will be Jews looking for food in Israel when missiles and rockets stop falling from the sky. Well, we don't know they're going to fall from the sky, but it might be a few, but God's not going to let them destroy Israel. When the terrorists are defeated and we can get back to preparing to receive the Messiah. Much of what I am about to report can also be taken to apply to the United States and Europe and around the world. There are many ways to collect and store survival food depending on how gourmet you want to go. My idea of survival is basic, and basic means basic, like beans, rice, wheat, some cooking oil, and some seeding to make it palatable. My problem with cooking oil, folks, it don't keep very long. Cooking oil gets rancid, no matter what you do with it. Uh, you got to use it in a few months to get rancid. There are some expensive freeze-dried foods you can buy, but they are costly. You may you can buy a dehydrator and dehydrate them nearly any vegetable. But the quickest, cheapest way to get ready for what is coming is to buy yourself some Mylar bags, the size that fits a six-gallon bucket. Fill them with beans, rice, wheat, and maybe noodles. And then again, folks, you can put some bay leaves in it, a couple of bay leaves in there, or freeze it in your freezer, because if there's any weevil eggs around, they can eat that stuff up. You can seal the bags with ordinary home iron set on a wool setting. The Mylar bags are all you need to store food for years. You can buy the oxygen pads to put in them with a, with a couple of bay leaves, the cans you put are in, the model bags in just keep the rodents out of your food. That's right. You got to keep you got to keep the mice away from your stuff. The main thing though is not food, it is water. You need ways to filter dirty water. You said you can get this gravity filter called the Big Berkey, which has been used by missionaries for decades and works great. You can buy drum plastic drums, and you keep a gallon of bleach. And one drop in clear water, one drop of Clorox in clear water will will purify that Clorox by that the gallon jug of water after about 20 minutes sitting there. It'll be there'll be no bacteria alive in it. If you use if you use any non-clear water, it's got kind of Giardius Giardius is in it, and uh, you can get a bucket and put sand and dirt in it and a cloth at the bottom and a cloth at the top, six-gallon bucket, put some holes in the bottom, and then you put the water in the top of that bucket. By the time it gets to all that dirt in there and the sand in there, it'll have cleared, cleared anything out of it out the bottom. It'll come out clear at the bottom. He said, you may find the second way to to uh, 
Well, he says, I'll read what it says. Second wave new to you is called aquaponics. Aqu- aquaponics, A Q U A P O N I C S. Look it up on the internet. Much easier than you think and could feed you and your family forever with fish and vegetables. I could go into a lot of details on survival, but I've written a few articles a while back on the subject. You go to Golden Report and you can look it up for the information. Unless you have an army to fight with you, don't think about fighting to save your resources. Think about hiding or training to fight another day and possibly another way. When a gang shows up at the front door of your house with rifles firing, will you... I'm going to read just what he says here. A gang shows up in the front of the house with AK-47s firing it. Will you have to know... Well, you have to know that they want your food, and killing you will be mean nothing to a hungry mob. So keep this, that in mind in your placement of the food and how let others know what you're doing. Now, Bob spoke to me about my friend. He said, your friend down the street's going to have to defend his stuff. Uh, he's he's run his mouth too much about it, okay? And that's, that's probably the truth. It's, that's the truth. Begin to find others of like mind and bond with them. Make gathering together arrangements for when it all comes down, and it's coming down. Okay, so now you've made up your mind and that I'm either nuts or I really care for you and your survival. For those reading this who know me, know I am also preparing to save as many Jewish lives as possible who will be running for their lives out of Europe and elsewhere. God has made promises to those who love him and abide by his word. He says he will bless those that bless Israel. As the time of the Gentile closes, the time for God's prophetic word concerning Israel and soon coming of the Messiah is unfolding before our eyes. I ask you to read Genesis 12, verse 3, and pray if you have a part in this ministry. God has given me an added burden to store food in quantities to feed those who will be bringing by boat or by however to Israel. This will be done mostly by modern bags full of staples and necessity survival until the other the order has been restored in Israel. My prayer has been more of a conversation with God when this burden fell upon me over the last few weeks. I remember saying to God, we don't have the finances to buy a larger a, a larger conveyance. There's much preparation to be done. How can we take on such a responsibility at this time? And his answer was, by faith, trust in me. So, precious people, I'm stepping out once again by faith and believing God to touch those whom he will, for we know one thing, this is not a one-man show, but it's about a ministry. Well, He had a, a real state of uh, tyranny here. A guy writes, uh, the government shutdown is a hoax. It is pure theater designed to make life as miserable as possible for Americans while the government keeps collecting taxes, racking up debt, expenditures, running foreign wars, and doing all the unconstitutional things that government does these days. It is now becoming obvious to nearly every American that the Obama administration is running a pernicious, punitive, selective shutdown that's designed to hold the American people hostage until Obama gets his way. His ransom demand, quote-unquote, is total capitulation to his demands for endless spending, the total takeover of medicine by Obamacare, and the centralization of power at the hands of the few. Obamacare is probably not going to make it, folks, and so the government is just going to take over under martial law scenario. And they need something to cover up us mess. They need a major news event to cover up this event, cover up all this stuff that's going on. And I suspect this false flag and the power outage, if it comes, will be part of it. The American Thinker magazine reports the feds are placing cones along highway viewing areas around Mount, outside Mount Rushmore, barring visitors from pulling over and taking pictures of the monument. Then lying about the reason. That's right. 
The National Park Service is trying to prevent people from even seeing Mount Rushmore. <laughs> well, they put barricades around the, vet- the World War II Veterans Memorial, World War II mm-hmm. Memorial. And like one sister said, it takes 40 days, and I can, I can vouch for this. I sent an email out about it. It takes about a month to get the, the quickest government response for anything. You need forms printed or signs printed. You've got to put the thing in a month in advance to get them all done. Well, this shutdown came, and these signs appeared right the next day on all these memorials and everything, all these sites. The signs were already made. They had them already planned ahead of time. So you need to be praying what you're supposed to be doing. I've told you guys time and time again, uh, time and time again, to be thinking about it, getting out of bed and praying. Pay your tithes. And the Jerry Golden. One day you're not going to be able to do that. But just because you go to a Bible study don't mean you don't pay your tithes. Okay? You pay tithes on the increase the Lord has given you. That's how he supports his church. He supports his church. He supports whatever he does by tithes. He can do more with, you can do more, he can do more with the 90% left after the tithe is paid, then you can do with the whole 100%. Because I'll guarantee you, he'll make you, he'll teach you, if he's going to teach you anything, he'll, if you don't pay your tithes, he will show you that you made a mistake. The two times that I didn't pay him, I paid dearly. I was going to hold off from paying him for a while. Don't even hold off when you pay him the next day, somehow. I'm telling you, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver, but I don't know what he thinks about a stingy Christian. If you can't get past your pocketbook, there's not, there's not much he can do with you. The love of money is the root of all evil. This pastor down here who, 1991, wrote a letter to the radio station tried to get me off the radio station. This dude had a gymnasium in his house, a swimming pool in his house. Drive around in a Lincoln or a Mercedes. And he wrote the radio station and said, get Al Cuppet off the radio. Because he was getting too many people coming into his church asking about these phony Bibles that were floating around. He couldn't answer the question. He couldn't answer the question. He avoids me. I see him every now and then. The pastor whose church I was in in 1985 is now a superintendent of the district. And my uh, second cousin's son and J.C. Skipper's grandson, same person, is trying to get their credentials back to preach from the church. And he went down to the headquarters to talk to the superintendent. And the superintendent, last question, he says, you don't believe that you don't you know you, you don't believe that only people that use the King James Bible are going to heaven. You don't believe that, do you? He says no, but he says I use it all the time. I use only the King James Bible. This pastor went to Bible school. And they taught him that the word of God was not in English, it was in Greek and Hebrew. Well he didn't learn Greek and Hebrew. But we don't speak Greek and Hebrew. Why do we need Greek and Hebrew? We've got an English Bible. Got a hymn book. Folks, uh, anything I can tell you, you've got to be in prayer. And if you and your wife get along and they're using the same King James Bible, you can pray for pray with each other in the morning. Have a little time of devotion, this is prayer together, and then you sometime in the during the day you want to be able to pray apart. I get up early in the morning. My wife prays around 9 o'clock. He goes to that church that tried to kick me out, kicked me out four times. So, uh, what can I say? 
Well, next week will be the 14th. We week from now is the 14th. I hope we have a program. I hope I have a program on the thir- in the 12th also. It should be Tuesday with the Mega Man. Uh, I'm going to keep checking things and trying to keep track of stuff. Email's not working too well. It's working, but I I got things done. Things got formats all changed. I got to figure out how to get it straight. And I can't figure it out, but it's working. Pay for me. Uh, me and Bob got big things to do one day. I figured that out. I figured that out. The only we're the only two people I know on planet Earth who've been providentially given the uh, the name of the Antichrist. He was given in Revelation, and I got it in 1987. He got the word straight from the Lord, and never, as far as I know, he'd never heard it before. So, folks, with that, I'm going to say a prayer and let you go. Um, if you want to reach me, you can reach me at Al Cuppet at Terra Postmaster, Wolftown, Virginia. I will try to answer your letter. Just remember... Uh, I'm retired, and uh, cassettes. I got I got a six I got six cassette printer, and it, those cassettes are eighteen dollars, fifteen to eighteen dollars a piece. A zinc cassette. Nothing's free except salvation and maybe air. Okay. I want you if you want to support the producer, the network, you write me a. Care of Al Cuppet. Care of the Postmaster, Wolftown, Virginia, 22748. And I will tell you how you can support him, what you can do. And we thank you for a few who do send in support. I do this uh, gratis, G R A T I S. Look it up in Latin. I can get paid a nickel for it. I'm going to ask a nickel for it. And now, Lord, bless you all. I'm going to pray now and close the show. Father, we just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. We ask you to bless the, the listeners tonight. Lord, let us prepare this next week, this coming week, oh, Lord. May we in, be in prayer, Lord, and be seeking your face. We might fast as you lead us, Lord. Guide us and direct us and watch over us and show us what's coming down, Lord, what's happening in the future. What we should do. We love you. We give you praise and honor and glory. Father, for your beloved Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. My Jewish friends, O oh Lord, warn them and move them, Jesus. Get them out of here quick. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen and amen. My folks, uh, it would appear to be. We've got seven days before, we've got six days before the 13th gets here. I don't know what they're planning. I suspect, uh, I'm praying I'll see you again. Uh, but you never know. You never know what they're planning exactly. But we'll try to figure it out, what they have done and who they're going to blame, what they blame and who they blame, and how they do it. Once it takes place, Hopefully, we'll be able to figure out what they did. Okay? So, they have a way of doing things, and if you watch them close, you can figure out what they did, but if we have a power fair, who knows what's going to happen? Anyhow, it looks that way. But uh, just pray that the Lord stops them and delays it as long as it can be delayed. The judgment can be delayed, but it cannot be stopped. So, we just elected a governor here who's going to sign in homosexual rights uh, first thing he does in office. He's a political hack. He's never held an office in political office, which is... And he was maneuvered into office by Kraft. And uh, he knows what's going on. Biden and the president and these governors, uh, public and Democratic governors, they know what's going on behind the scenes, Okay. They know what's happening. They know about the foreign troops. They know about the foreign cops. They're hoping to get off the hook. 
but you can't trust a traitor. A traitor is entrusted by the people he betrays, and he, he is entrusted by those he works for. And betraying is crimpy. I love you all. Uh, I hope to see you next week. May the Lord bless and keep you. To my Jewish friends, I'm Ishokai Tamid. We'll see you next week, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Al. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Al Cuppet on Freedom Fighters for America World Radio. Al will be back next Tuesday at 8 p.m., God willing. And uh, we want to thank you for uh, tuning in to this episode. And uh, now that we are back in a new studio, we will be doing new additional shows. So please uh, tune in for those as well and stop by at the network. Freedom Fighters for America World Radio is sponsored by Freedom Fighters for America at www.freedomfightersforamerica.com. Thanks once again.